Once the rapture takes place, once the faithful church is removed and the day of the Lord commences, when God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist, understand something. The age of the church has come to an end. This idea that the rapture is going to hatch a great end time revival is a lot of baloney. It's a lot of hideous nonsense. The scripture tells us during the day of the Lord, when he pours out his wrath, men still did not depart of their evil deeds. That's what it says. The idea that there's going to be a great re is nonsense. It's total nonsense. Revelation chapter 7 is the rapture and resurrection. It is the episunagage. It is not, not some later event with tribulation saints. The idea that the climax of the age, the return of Jesus, the rapture and resurrection is not in there, that God would leave it out, is silly. He has not left it out. It's in Revelation chapter 7. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation. Once the faithful church is removed, and let no one tell you differently, I will argue this in any debate, once the faithful church is removed, the overwhelming emphasis of Scripture shows that the primary focus of God is again on Israel and the Jews. The age of the church is completed. The time of the Gentiles has come to a close. Once the rapture and resurrection take place, God primarily turns his focus back to the salvation of Israel and the Jews during a very, very dark hour of their history. I'm working on a new book entitled No Bomb in Gilead, which addresses this subject. In any event, my offer stands. Now again, I do not want this to be confrontational. My argument is with those who do not believe in a rapture. With those people, I have a problem. Not with my brethren who place it at a different point in the constellation of end time events. I accept the fact that there are people who believe as I do that there is a rapture who may place that at a different point. And I'm happy to debate that on brotherly terms, on non-confrontational, non-hostile terms. I don't consider them to be heretics. Some of them would consider me to be a false teacher because I don't agree with them on the timing, but I don't say that about preacher people. Uh, at least not the traditional preacher people, like Mark Hitchcock or Arnold Fruchtenbaum. These are the ones who were saying that the apostasy is the rapture. Well, that's just complete nonsense. That's just absurd. Traditional preacher people did not believe that. They're divided against themselves now. It's a house divided against itself. Pre-tribulationism. They put out a book about two and a half years ago called The Rapture Handbook with all these pre-tribulational writers, and they were expressing, all these pre-trib authors were expressing contradictory positions. They don't even agree with each other anymore to the point that they ever did. But for me, my opponents are those who deny there, there is a rapture. My opponents are people like Rick Joyner or Gerald Cro Coates in Great Britain or people who, who denounce or mock the rapture or deny there is one. 
with such people, I have a problem. Someone showed me a book today by someone called Hans Schwartz, uh, a professor in a Lutheran seminary. With people like that, I have a problem. With other people who believe in the rapture but don't place it at the same point I do, I have no personal problem. I think they're believers. I don't consider them to be heretical. I just think they're misguided on the timing. Now that's an important issue, a very important issue. It warrants discussion, it warrants debate, it warrants theological symposium, but in my view it does not warrant division. Unfortunately, some of them think it does. In any event, that's my offer. It's cordial will be civilized, it will not be hostile or confrontational, but I'm pulling out all the stops. I'm not going to hold back. I will prove what Darby was and that their doctrine is coming from somebody who began this nonsense in the 19th century. I will prove from the patristic literature the early church did not believe this pre-trib fairy tale. And as their own patriarch, their academic patriarch, their scholarly Father, John Woolward admitted, it's not in there. They cannot find a single passage in exegetical context that teaches it. Now, if John MacArthur couldn't find it, and if John Woolward couldn't find it, I don't think they can find it either. And there's a good reason they can't find it, because it's not there. They've admitted it. But I say that without hostility or a desire for conflict. Satan does not want the faithful church to be ready for the return of Jesus. When you begin telling people, you don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid, you're going to be out of here when raptured before any of this happens. Don't worry about the Antichrist. That is a sanitized version of Kenneth Copeland. You don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. You don't have to suffer. You're a king's kid. Remember, the freedom you have in Canada or the United States or Great Britain is a historical anomaly. Most saved Christians throughout the history of the church were persecuted for their beliefs, even by the mainstream churches and denominations. The freedom we have in Canada or the States was indirectly bequeathed us from Great Britain. It was bought by the blood of martyrs, you understand? It was bought by the blood of the freedom we have was bought for us and Mother Britain by the blood of martyrs in the aftermath of the Reformation. It's a historical anomaly. But now that the British Commonwealth and Great Britain and America are turning away from their Judeo-Christian heritage, that freedom is disappearing. Christ said you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. The idea because you live in British Columbia, or Cornwall, England, or California, or Australia, or New Zealand, means that you're better than the Christians in China, or Vietnam, or Saudi Arabia where I've been, or other countries where the church is persecuted. Oh, that's just for them. Only they're going to be persecuted. We're going to be raptured before Jesus comes. This is a lie. It is a delusion. This pre-trib thing's a myth. The Lord may come tonight for me, he may come tonight for you. But he's not coming for the church corporately until we know who the man of lawlessness is, as Mike pointed out. My offer stands, but without contempt. Without contempt. There are people who love the Lord who have been I would almost use the term brainwashed by this fairy tale. They've been taught it their whole lives. They've never thought outside the box. But you know what? That box isn't even 150, 200 years old. Turn with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 23, Christ and Christianity. Very briefly, I would also point out 
that I have a high regard for many pre-trib preachers on other issues. David Hawking, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Mark Hitchcock, Amir Tzafari, I agree with those brethren on most other issues. And I even agree with them on the rapture. It's just the timing of it where we part company. But these are good men with whom I'm in, in agreement on most other issues, if not all other issues. Again, there's no hostility in the, my ethos concerning this subject. But pre-trib is a fairy tale. It's a myth. Jeremiah 23, please. One of the most important chapters in Scripture and understanding the last days. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus recycled the main end times themes of Jeremiah. The first temple and the second temple were destroyed the same day of the year by the Hebrew calendar. Tasha Ba'av, roughly the 9th of August. The Romans destroyed the second temple on the same day the Babylonians destroyed the first. When Jeremiah was rejected and left for dead, that provoked God's judgment on Judah. When Jesus was rejected, crucified, that provoked God's judgment when he was rejected as Messiah in 70 AD. The Shabbat of the temple was destroyed the same day. The early Christians identified Rome with Babylon, who destroyed the first temple in 585 BC. They identified Rome with Babylon. Peter writing his epistle, she who was in Babylon greets you. Again, if you don't know, false religion has its origins in Babylon in the days of Nimrod and Semiramis with the Tower of Babel and so forth. It finds its way from Babylon when the Babylonian Empire falls in accordance with the prophecies of Isaiah, the 300, high, the 300 pagan priests of Babylon literally migrated westward to Pergamum. They took the mystery religions of Pergamum and set up shop in Pergamum. Jesus referred to Pergamum as the place where Satan's throne is, probably making some reference to the altar of Zeus that stood there at the time. Pergamum was the gateway of bringing the Babylonian religions into the Greco-Roman world, into the pantheon of Rome, but they come from Babylon. Thus Peter the Apostle writes in his epistle, she who is in Babylon greets you. But he's talking about Rome. The descriptions of the city and the woman on seven hills, that they would have understood that as Rome at the end of the first century. Rome is identified with Babylon. Babylon destroys the first temple. Rome destroys the second temple. Again, my apologies to those who know this. In London, England, you had Scotland Yard in the days of Sherlock Holmes, right? Scotland Yard is an alleyway between two buildings running from the Whitehall down to the Thames Embankment near the Houses of Parliament. It's just a, not even a street, it's an alleyway between two buildings called Scotland Yard. And that was the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police. Today, Scotland Yard is in a modern building, large building, opposite the British Home Office on Victoria Street, about a half mile away, but they still call it Scotland Yard. The institution is still called Scotland Yard. The original location becomes a metaphor for the institution. In my native New York, the original New York Stock Exchange was on Wall Street. Today the entrance is on Broad Street in Lower Manhattan, but they still call it Wall Street. Okay. The original Broadway theaters were all on Broadway in Manhattan. Now only a few are on Broadway. Most of them are on the side streets between Broadway and 8th Avenue. But they still call the theater industry in New York Broadway. Babylon is no different. The original location becomes a byword or a metaphor for the institution. False religion. Okay. That's the idea. Jeremiah is prophesying for two time frames and then the third one. Like all of Israel's prophets, he's prophesying for his own time. He's prophesying for the first coming of the Messiah. And he is prophesying for the second coming of the Messiah. 
sometimes all in one passage, sometimes all in one verse. And so we go through the exercise. What's for his own time? What's for the first coming of Christ? What's for the second coming of Christ? Or what is for some combination? When we turn to the New Testament, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Luke 17, etc. Okay? The themes of Jeremiah are recycled for the church. The temple, big deal in Jeremiah and its destruction. Okay? The proliferation of false teachers and especially of false prophets. Okay? The themes that are in the book of Jeremiah are recapitulated in the last days and they are recycled by Jesus in his prophetic warnings of what's going to come. But the core of it, its source, is Jeremiah, Yermiyahu, Hanavi. Let's look at chapter 23, verse 1. Here is how it begins. This is Jeremiah's polemic against the false prophets. Now the word for prophet is navi, plural navim. But it doesn't say, woe to the navim, oi le rovib. It doesn't say, oi la navim. It says, oi le roim, woe to the shepherds. The Hebrew word for shepherd is roe, the one who looks over. It is the same word for pastor. In Greek, it could be either translated episkopo, overseer, episkopos, or poeon. But in both Greek and Hebrew, the word pastor means a shepherd of the flock. The first problem when you live in an age of apostasy or deception, as Jeremiah lived in, and as the last days are going to be like and are like, the first problem are not the false prophets themselves. The first problem is always the pastors who do not protect the sheep from them. Woe to the shepherds. As we pointed out many times in John chapter 10, there are three kinds of pastors. There are good shepherds who like Christ, who will lay their lives down for the sheep. And I've met pastors like this in Vietnam and other places. The second kind are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're in it to fleece the sheep. Most pastors are neither good shepherds nor are they wolves. Unfortunately, in the consumerist age in which we live, most pastors are the third category that Jesus describes in John 10. Hirelings. The ministry is their job. It is their career. It is their profession. Not even a vocation per se. Their priorities are always their own interests. Their salary their accommodation allowance, their pension, their credentials with the denomination, their standing in the community, their this, their that, their anything. Everything but the word of God and the welfare of his sheep. Hirelings. Now Jesus was quite blatant as to how you recognize a hireling. You want to know if a pastor, if your pastor, if any pastor is a hireling? It's simple. Jesus tells us. A hireling will not protect the sheep from the wolves. They'll let people listen to Kenny, Benny, and Joyce read all kinds of crazy books, the shack or whatever, they don't care. They will not protect the sheep from the wolves. And of course they churn out the usual diet of religious garbage. And the, the, it's, it's almost a litany of absurdity what they come out with. Just chew the meat and spit out the bones. No, no, no. Second Peter chapter 2. False teachers and false prophets were patasogzusin. They will put truth next to error. You want to put a couple of drops of arsenic in tea and sip it? It's homogeneous, homogeneous. It doesn't work that way. 
a little leaven leavens the entire lump. It doesn't work that way. Forget about eat the meat and spit out the bones. It's not like that. Now, we're not talking about secondary doctrines. We're talking about fundamental ones. Another religious gibberish. Oh, we just have to love. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, one of the most important verses for the age in which we live. That your love, agape, may abound more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. If there is not a knowledge of doctrine and discernment, you don't have the love of Jesus. You have an emotionally charged religious idiocy pretending to be love. It's people running on emotion and feelings. It's just religious idiocy. It's emotionally charged religi religiosity. The idea that love and truth are mutually exclusive is a lie and a stupid lie. Philippians 1.9 tells us directly that they're mutually dependent. Jesus never compromised truth in the name of love. Just think of the Syrophoenician woman. Help my little girl, she's demon-possessed. I can't give the children's bread to the dogs. That sounds like a racist statement almost, but he was not dealing with her ethnicity. He was dealing with her beliefs. She was a pagan. He's saying, you're coming to me, the Jewish Messiah, to help your little girl who's demonically possessed? Stop believing that garbage. Then I can help your little girl. He made her deal with her false beliefs before he could help her daughter. What she believed was not fit for human consumption. It was dog food. Roman Catholicism is dog food. Talmudic Judaism is dog food. Mormonism is dog food. These things are not fit for human consumption. Jesus pulled no punches. He confronted her wrong belief. You're going to worship bread and wine as Christ incarnate? Jesus said, not me, Jesus said, I'm going and I'm coming back the way I'm leaving. If anybody tells you I've returned physically, get away, don't believe it. He's in the wilderness, don't go there. In the inner rooms, don't go there. But every time there's a mess, the Roman church teaches that Jesus Christ has returned physically under the appearances of bread and wine. They call it the Blessed Sacrament. They literally worship it. They worship it as Christ physically returned. Any ex-Catholics here? Am I right or wrong? Woof, woof, woof. We're the Church of Jesus Christ, the Lord of Thy Saints, and I testify to you, the Church of Lord of Thy Saints is true. Woof, woof, woof. Jesus is only an angel; he's not God. Jehovah's Witness. Woof. It's dog food. He never compromised truth in the name of love. Because he loved, he told the truth. He made people deal with the issues. Those who tell you otherwise are extremely ignorant and they're thinking with their emotions instead of their brains. They're not worth paying any attention to. And if they're a pastor, they're a shame and a disgrace. They shouldn't be a pastor because they're not a pastor. They're a hireling. Then there's another one. Oh, we just have to teach the truth. The Lord will sort out the error. We shouldn't name these names and say who it is. Okay, so when the apostles wrote the Gospels, they were wrong. Watch out for Hymenius. Watch out for Alexander the coppersmith. Watch out for Philetus. Watch out for Diotrephes. The apostles shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have warned the churches who were misleading them. The Hebrew prophets shouldn't have named these people like Hananiah or the backslidden kings of Israel. It's all nonsense. 
Then they get their catchphrase. This was my personal favorite because it's so ludicrous. That's not my anointed. First of all, they're not the anointed of the Lord. They may be your anointed, but they're not God's. That verse comes from Samuel, it comes from Psalms, and it comes from Chronicles. All three times it makes reference to David's encounter at the cave of Ein Gedi with King Saul. King Saul really was God's anointed, so David wouldn't kill him. But did it stop David from telling the truth about King Saul? That he was a murderer and a backslider? And a practitioner of the occult, a necromancer? Did it stop Samuel from writing the truth about Saul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and putting it in God's word forever? No, it did not. They quote that verse out of context to an unbelievable degree. Woe to the shepherds. If any pastor lets that stuff go on, he ought to clean up his act or get out of the ministry. Woe to the shepherds. The false prophets are going to be there. The false teachers are going to be there. It's the pastor's responsibility to make sure the sheep are fed the proper food. And it's the pastor's responsibility to make sure the sheep are protected from the wolves. Every pastor is going to give account to Christ for the welfare of that sheep. I don't care if you're a leader of a house church with a dozen people or if you're a pastor of a mega church, you will give account and so will I. Now the teachers and false prophets are something different. That's even beyond that. James 3.1, let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. When we stand before Jesus, he's going to hold me more accountable than he holds most of you. I know most of you know this. I'm saying it for those watching. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture. The sheep scatter after this stuff. You can build a house based on marketing, based on the purpose-driven lie. You can build mega churches on this stuff, but you can't make them stand. The first mega church built on marketing, Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral. What became of it? Motivational psychology, the power of positive thinking, Norman Vincent Peale, 33rd degree mason comes to church at Shula. What's left of the airport vineyard church in Toronto where everybody used to come as if it was Mecca? <laughs> Brownsville Assemblies of God after the financial scandal. What happened with the tattooed goon in Lakeland? You can build a house on hype and on marketing and on entertainment pretending to be worshipped. You can build a house on it, but you cannot make it stand. Once the freak show is over, people will go find another freak. The sheep scatter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You've scattered my flock and driven them away. You've not attended to them. Behold, I'm about to attend to you for your evil of your deeds. God calls these deeds evil. Declares the Lord, then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock. Out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply, I will also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any missing be missing, declares the Lord. He's obviously speaking of the post-captivity prophets like Ezra and Nehemiah for that time. But then he's speaking for the first coming of Jesus. Let's look. 
Days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David, a descendant of David, a righteous branch. Metzot Tzadik. He will reign as king and wisely do justice and righteousness in the land. In his day, Judah will be saved. Israel will dwell securely, and this is his name by which he will be called. Adonai Tzidkatenu. Yehovah Tzidkatenu. The Lord, our righteousness. He will be God, who will be our personal shepherd. Jesus was divine, whether the Jehovah's Witnesses and Christadelphians like it or not. Let's look. A righteous branch. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Nativity narrative, very briefly. Matthew chapter 2, verse 23. And he came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. What prophets? There is no such verse anywhere in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh. It's not in there. No place does it say the Messiah will be called the Nazarene. Now liberal higher critics would say that means Matthew made a mistake or didn't know what he was talking about. Rabbinic scholars have said that. They are not being honest. In biblical Hebrew, there is wordplay, just as in English. Only in English, modern English, we use wordplay as a joke or as an advertising gimmick. Okay? You draw people's attention to something as a joke or an advertising gimmick. Let us synchronize our watches. Let us sympathize our watches. <laughs> or, I, when I was a little boy in New York, there was a company called Quality Coal, K-O-A-L, instead of C-O-A-L. It's just an advertising gimmick to draw somebody's attention to something to make it stand out. In Biblical Hebrew, it was a way of bold texting something or italicizing something. You'd use word play. You'd use one word that sounded like another, only instead of a joke or an advertising gimmick, it was to draw people's attention to something very serious and important. Okay? Get this, this is important, get this, when they would use wordplay. Look at the book of Amos as one example, chapter 8. The Lord showed me a basket, a basket of summer fruit. Now, of course, if the fruit is not harvested by summer, it's going to be burned up in Israel. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit, priyakayets. Then the Lord said, the end has come for my people Israel. I'll spare them no longer. That's it. The ten northern tribes are going to go into the Assyrian captivity in 720 B.C. That's it. Finished. The word summer, kayets, kayets in Hebrew. The word terminal, end, termination, kets, kets. A basket of summer fruit, priya kayets, kayets, kets. You use one word that sounds like another. You substitute the word with another word that sounds like it. That was a way of boldening and italicizing the text to make it stand out. A literary device, a textual technique used by the scribes, the Sophrim. So there's no verse that says he will be called a Nazarene from the word Nezer, Nezer. But here in Jeremiah 23, we see the Messiah will be called a righteous branch, a Netzer, Netzer. Isaiah chapter 11, prophecy about the Messiah. A root will spring from the Shortish Ishai, the root of Jesse, and a Netzer, a branch from his roots. Well, there is no verse that says he shall be called a Nezer, as a Nazarene. You have verses in Jeremiah and in Isaiah that are messianic prophecies. He shall be called a Netzer, Netzer. 
It is Hebrew wordplay. And the rabbis know this, of course, but they just bank on the fact that other people don't know it because they're trying to persuade Jewish people not to believe Jesus fulfills these prophecies. He will be a righteous branch. Then it continues. Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. Well, they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought us up, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought us up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I have driven them. Then they will live on their own soil. He's speaking now again of the recovery from Babylon. Having dealt with the shepherds, the pastors, bearing in mind Ezekiel 34 tells us the kings of Israel and Judah were to be their shepherds, like David. As for the prophets, my heart is broken within me, in verse 9, my bones tremble. I become like a drunken man, even like a man overcome with wine because of the Lord and because of his holy words. If you can believe it, there were people in Ontario from the Toronto experience using that verse to justify behavior that mimicked inebriation. As if it was a blessing, something positive. It's something negative. For the land is filled with adultery. The land mourns because of the curse. The pastures of the wilderness have dried up. Their course also is evil and their might is not right. For both prophet and priest are polluted. Even in my house I found their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore their way will be slippery paths to them. They'll be driven away into the gloom and fall down in it. I will bring calamity upon them. The year of their punishment declares the Lord. Now understand adultery. It is not just speaking about marital infidelity. It is speaking about idolatry. Israel was God's woman as the church is the bride of Christ. Hence the prophets like Hosea referred to the idolatry as adultery. Daughter of Zion, you've played the harlot. Things like this, znut. Going after other gods was adultery in a spiritual sense. Okay. But notice it was the prophet and the priest who were misleading them. The clergy and the false prophets. Please don't take my word for any of this. Go on YouTube and watch it. The tattooed goon, Todd Bentley, born in this country where he's a criminally convicted homosexual pedophile, says he repented. He's banned from Great Britain and from Australia. They won't give him a visa because there were films presented of him kicking old ladies in the face. Saying that he has an angel called Emma. Where is there a female angel? But that's what he claims. This was a familiar spirit or just a fabrication. Now he says he has an angel called International Banker. Unbelievable. Four proven false prophets, Cheon, Bill Johnson from Bethel in Redding, California, Rick Joyner, and C. Peter Wagner. All four of them lay hands on him and prophesy over him in front of huge amounts of people. It's on the internet. They prophesy how this guy covered with tattoos, which he got after he became a Christian, is going to lead the great revival. The whole time he was committing adultery. The prophets and the priests mislead the people. And you can prove this. They can watch it on YouTube. And they'll still go to Bethel and Bill Johnson, who's a mystic and a Gnostic. 
This is the kind of outrage that took place in the days of Jeremiah. And it's the kind of outrage that takes place in the last days before Jesus comes. It's what's happening in the time in which we live. Let us look. It's all wickedness. Verse 12, therefore their way will be like a slippery path. They're going down. Moreover, among the prophets of Samaria, I saw an offensive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people astray. Also among the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen a horrible thing. The committing of adultery and walking in falsehood. And they strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one has turned back from his wickedness. All of them have become to me like Sodom and her descendants like Gomorrah. Samaria and the Samaritans were there now. The Assyrians begin to colonize them and intermarry with the Hebrews who were left and not exiled. Begin to prophesy by Baal. And then this comes to Jerusalem. Now understand Baal, if you don't know, is the Hebrew word for husband, master, and owner. Yahweh was to be Israel's Baal. But the Canaanites also had a Baal who rose from the dead every spring in Canaanite mythology. But they're both called Baal. You got a Baal, we got a Baal, everybody's got to have a Baal. It must be the same Baal. Two people named Robert Jones in the Vancouver Telephone Directory. They must be the same guy. There's probably 15 people named Robert Jones in the Vancouver Telephone Directory, and they most certainly are not the same guy but because they come in the same name. What did Jesus say? Many will come in my name. We're the church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. That's a different Jesus. The Book of Mormon says that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. The Word of God says he's the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. The Mormons have a different Jesus. Our Jesus said, I'm coming back the way I left. If anyone says I've returned physically, don't believe it. In the wilderness, don't believe it. The inner rooms, don't believe it. No, he's transubstantiated. He comes back as a cup of wine and a chalice and a piece of bread. The Eucharistic Christ of Rome is not the real Christ. Muslims will tell you, the Quran speaks more about Jesus than it does Muhammad. That's true. Except everything it says about him contradicts what the New Testament says about him. Allah has no son. He's not begotten, neither does he beget. He's not the son of God. He's a prophet inferior to Muhammad. It was Judas who died on the cross, not Jesus. That's what they believe. It's a different Jesus. <coughs> They have a different Christ. The cosmic Christ of the New Ages, Matria and all, this is a different Christ. Just because he has the same name or the same title doesn't mean it's him. It's a different Baal. It is not the true bridegroom of the bride. That's what was happening in Jeremiah's day. That's what's happening now. But let's look. They prophesied by Paul. They led my pe people astray. It's come even into my house. Moreover, among the prophets, I saw an offensive thing. Prophesied by Baal, led my people astray, and in Jerusalem it's happening. They commit adultery and walking in falsehood. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one has turned back from his wickedness. They've not repented. All of them have become to me like Sodom and the inhabitants of Gomorrah. What came next? A religious acceptance of bisexuality and homosexuality. Here in Canada, a pastor was fined 15,000 Canadian dollars. 
simply for reading Romans chapter 1 in his own church and he was accused of a hate crime and fined $15,000 in Canada. And that was several years ago. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, I'm going to feed them wormwood and make them drink poisonous water. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, pollution has gone forth into the land. Major evangelical figures, three weeks ago, Eugene Peterson, the translator of the bastardized perversion of the word of God called the message, that bears no resemblance to the original Greek and Hebrew. Rick Warren's Bible of Choice. Eugene Peterson, three weeks ago, said he would perform a same-sex marriage in his church. David Jeremiah likes him. Huh? Tony Campolo. He said, some woman got his phone number and called him up crying one night. She asked, was homosexuality a sin? And he said, yes. Scripture says it's a sin. He says, why are you calling me up this late at night? It's been a long day and you're asking me this. And she said, because my son was a homosexual and killed himself three weeks ago. That caused him to change his position on something the Word of God says is wrong. His son Bart, a humanist chaplain at a university in California says, if there's something in the Word of God and there is that says homosexuality is wrong, he will either ignore it or spiritualize it away. Now he's gone into rank unbelief. Steve Chalk, the number one youth minister in Great Britain, calling on the church to change its position on same-sex marriage. The pop star, Cliff Richard, calling on the church to change its position on same-sex marriage. These are evangelical Figures, leaders, unbelievable. Then comes Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what happened in the days of Jeremiah. That's what's happening now. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Adonai Tzavaot, do not listen to the words of the prophets who are prophesying to you. Don't listen to people like Rick Joyner or Che An or Bill Johnson. They're leading you into futility. They speak a vision of their own imagination, not from the mouth of the Lord. It comes from their own imagination. What is being called prophecy today more often than not, is clairvoyance. You hear what I said? Now, I do not deny the biblical charismatic gift of prophecy, but most of what you hear today is not prophecy. It is clairvoyance. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord has said you'll have peace. And as for everyone who walks in the stubbornness of their heart, they say, calamity will not come upon you. You're going to be raptured out of here before anything bad happens. Well, you're a king's kid. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. You don't have to suffer. That's only for the Christians in Saudi Arabia and China. But who has stood in the counsel of the Lord that he should see and hear his word? Who has given heed to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth and wrapped even a whirling tempest. It will swirl down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and carried out the purposes of his heart. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. You see verse 20. In the last days, you will clearly understand it. Well, that's quite a thing. In the last days. 
You'll understand that in the last days. Understand watch. <laughs> this anger and judgment is not what's coming on the homosexuals and the heathen and the Babylonians. Jeremiah doesn't deal with that till chapter 51. Judgment begins in the house of God. That's where it begins. His anger will be poured out on the backslidden leadership of the church before it's poured out on the world. In the last days. Now most people do not understand the last days. The word is eschatos in Greek in the New Testament. But it's a bit difficult. If you don't know, look with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 1, God spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. This refers to the Torah and the Haftorah, read ritually in the synagogue and the temple, the portion of the week. In these last days he spoken to us in his son. Notice they were in the last days in the first century church. We use the term last days. We have to be very careful. Most people mean something different than the scripture does. Last days is better translated latter days. The former days is the old covenant with Israel. The latter days is the new covenant with the church. We're already in the latter days. You understand? These are the latter days since the first century. What we call the latter days, the eschatos, we get the word eschatology. Jesus called that something different. He called it the close of the age. The close of the age. The last days as we would think of last days, the time leading up to the return of Jesus is called the close of the age. The apostles asked him, what will be the sign of the close of the age and of your coming? Okay. Last days is something different. We've been in the last days since the first century. If you don't know, the rapture and resurrection have already begun. They are proliptic events. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection. The resurrection has already begun with his resurrection. The rapture has already begun with his ascension. Okay. We're already in the last days. We're not waiting for the rapture or for the resurrection. We are waiting for our role in it. You understand? It's like D-Day, the Normandy invasion in 1944 in June. Everybody thinks it's June 6th when Canadian, American, British forces landed on the beaches of Normandy. Everybody thinks that's June 6th. But on June 5th, the people in the know understood that when American, British, Canadian paratroopers and commandos landed on back of German lines, that was the beginning of the invasion. The Germans just thought initially there were commando raids and things, but it was the preparation cut communications lines and so forth for the invasion on the 6th. But to the people in the know, D-Day was June 5th. But Eisenhower and, and the Churchill didn't tell everybody that. It was June 6th they realized it. Well, we're already in the last days, but only the people in the know, that is believers, are to understand it. The rest of them are going to find out after it's too late. The Germans found out it was the real invasion after it was too late. Well, that's the way it is. This world is going to find out after it's too late. But we're supposed to know already. In the last days, you will understand it. Well, these are the last days. But Daniel says, none of the wicked will understand. Christians who don't understand these things are not illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Those who love the Lord and long for His appearing are and will be illuminated up by the Holy Spirit. They will understand what's happening. Woe to the shepherds. That's the first problem. Not the false prophets and the false teachers. <laughs> 
It's the shepherds, the pastors who do not protect the church from them. That's the beginning. Then comes phase two. Quite a thing. Quite a subject. I'm out of time. But we have this teaching available on the internet, the rest of the chapter. Jeremiah 23. Woe to the shepherds. I don't know what kind of a church you go to. And I can't answer the question for you. You have to ask the question, and you have to find the answer for yourself. Do you have a pastor? Do you have a shepherd? Or do you have a hireling? Are you sitting under the ministry of a shepherd or of a hireling? That is the question you need to ask. If you're sitting under the ministry of a hireling, those wolves are going to get you. They're going to get your family, they're going to get your children and your grandchildren. Those wolves are going to get you. That hireling will never protect you from those wolves. It's not in his personal interest. Those wolves will get you. But if you're sitting under the ministry of a shepherd, a good shepherd like Jesus, no wolf is going to get you. You're not going to eat poison. And you are not going to be deceived. Well, what are we doing? We can't find the good church. Where should we go? If you can't find a biblically based church with a godly leadership based on Scripture, where should you go? Go home. Nobody says you have to have a church building. Not that I'm against church buildings. There are good churches and buildings and bad ones. But the church is not a building, it's the people in it. You're better off meeting in a home group with a handful of people who love the Lord, who are preaching the true gospel, who are looking for His return. You're better off in that than you are in some denying, Bible-denying denomination that's declining anyway. We live in a post-denominational era. Now the megachurches are cracking up and declining. The Lord's taken his hand off them. They're on a slippery slope if they've compromised with these things. Well, it's happening to them. But it doesn't have to happen to you. Remember, even if you don't have a pastor, you still have one. Adonai Tzidketenu, the Lord our righteousness, the Nazarene, the Netzer, the righteous branch. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you for listening.